The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So, thank you for coming. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Jason Edgecombe. I work in the College of Engineering, or excuse me, the William States Lee College of Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, if you need to, you can get me on Twitter. So, tell, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been a Linux administrator in the College of Engineering since 2006. I'm also the OpenAFS administrator. Uh, I share that duty with the, the rest of the team. Uh, I've been contributing to OpenAFS as a, a hobby since 2007. I'm also currently the BuildBot administrator, so I keep the builds running, uh, make sure we're compiling on you know, the, the seven or eight different platforms. And I've written at least 30 man pages. Uh, I've lost count. Those are the ones that just have my name as the author. The rest I've just you know, added contrib contributions to. So let me walk you through with what we use currently, we have 13 terabytes of data used. Uh, we got about 4,000 users. Uh, we've got, as far as OpenAFS servers themselves, we have three database servers, nine production file servers, and three tape backup machines with you know, typical tape changers, no big deal there. Uh, as far as non opening up the, the rest of the stuff, uh, we have you know, 1,300 desktops, some Linux desktops, Everybody's home directory is in AFS. So, you know, when you log in, uh, you just, all your data is in AFS. It follows you around. We have roaming profiles. It's really nice. Uh, we can take a machine, throw it out the window. You walk to the next one, log in, you're good. Yes, we do have people with large files and USB drives, but, you know, if you, if you store it on the network, you're good. Uh, we have about 50 production Linux servers doing various things. Uh, you know, Apache, MySQL, uh, I've got a couple of faculty members who I, I you know, they got grant servers for, we, uh, we manage those. We've got our all important Kerberos servers, which you need for OpenAFS, uh, a couple of print servers, and we got something I'm really proud of. We've got 12 compute servers. You know, these guys have like 64 gigs of RAM each, at least, some are 96 gig. And they tend to get hammered. So, how we use OpenFS, it is our primary network file system. Uh, we, like I said, we store all of our user data in there, uh, and it, it is the home directory for both Windows and Linux. So when you log in, your desktop is, is in OpenAFS, and if you're on Linux, you need to file from Windows, you just go up a couple of folders and back down another one, and it's all there. And if you drop your file on your Windows desktop and you go to, you know, without logging out, you go to another Linux machine or another Windows machine, the file just appears. So it's really nice that way. Uh, we have a heavily automated uh, machine build infrastructure. Uh, our Windows machines are not imaged, they're actually a, like a, a scripted install. And we do the Windows install with all the applications. We fire it up, it takes a few hours to run, but after that, I mean, it's fire and forget. Same thing with Linux, only it's faster. Uh, we've got, you know, I'll fire up a, I can build a workstation about 30 minutes to an hour, just depends on the network speed. Uh, once we get off the normal, you know, obviously you have SMB or NFS to actually start the initial installation, but after the kickstart or the install's done, then every, it kicks up, we've already configured AFS, it starts pulling everything out of AFS. So, for Windows, we have the applications are installed directly on the hard drive through the automated build. For Linux, we have a, a mixture of the two. So uh, you know, it's either RPM installed or it's sitting out in AFS on a shared folder, which is really easy. Uh, it works very well with the caching that's set up. And we actually kind of really encourage people to store the data on AFS. So basically anything on the local disk, especially the, the primary disk, the system disk, is erased at some point. Either, you know, it, it's just not permanent. 
Uh, if you do want local data, we tell you, okay, you need a second hard drive or third hard drive. And we just have a general principle that if it's the primary disk, we own it, we can wipe it at any time. Our automation requires that. All right, so that's enough about me uh, and the campus. Let me tell you what OpenAFS is. It's a distributed file system, and it offers several nice features like read-only replicas and limited snapshotting. Uh, it's location independent, which is very cool. So you know when you're dealing with SMB and NFS, you always have to tell it what server to mount. You don't do that in AFS. You tell it, okay, here's how I connect to the core AFS servers, and then your client queries those servers saying, where are my files? So you can actually move the files between different file servers and the client is automatically updated and notified and people don't even notice. You move stuff between servers, your paths don't change. Really cool like that. Uh, and this is a feature of the single system image right here. So you know, afsexample.org foobar exists on all AFS machines. And AFS is actually set up as a, a WAN, it's meant to be a, an open WAN file system. So what this means is if you actually have your cell open to the internet and someone else on the internet has you know, the, the, you know, the, the addresses of your, your main servers or your DB servers as they're called, they can actually connect your files and see them if you've got the ACL set properly. So if you install an AFS client, you don't have to have an AFS server running. If you install an AFS client right now, you go and look in slash AFS and you see, you know, you see 100 different sites. You can go browse the file system. It's a really handy way to, to share files and you don't have to even have to use HTTP. I'll get to that. <coughs> Pardon me. So it is federated. So what that means is you can set up a trust relationship with a different institution. So when they authenticate, they can actually, you know, your, your two cells, as they're called, know how to talk to one another and then your, their people actually become guests in your cell and you can actually give them, uh, give them rights. At, you know, okay, I'm your, your, your Joe at otherinstitution.edu or something. So it's, it's kind of nice like that too. Uh, something that doesn't, people don't quite understand is, you know, well, how do you connect to it? You know, I, I want to share, you know, can you, can you use SMB? No, it, open AFS or rather, AFS is a protocol. It requires a specialized client and a specialized server. Now, there are uh, more than one client. There's OpenAFS, um, Arla, and there's actually an AFS client in the Linux kernel called KAFS, uh, although that's, that one's fairly limited as to what it can do. The, the one that's used most often is, is obviously OpenAFS. So other features that it has, it has a very rich ACL, uh, access control mechanism. So I can say, you know, I, as a user, I can say I want to give Susie or Johnny access to my folders and they can only do read and look up. You know, they can only read, they can write, they can, only, they can drop a file in but they can't read what they did. I mean, it's, it's very nice as far as that regard. Uh, you can actually manage your own groups. So you can create groups and have just any number of users in them. You can even have nested groups. And you have transparent migration, which I, I just spoke about briefly. When you, like if the user is actually actively using their files, you know, not too much, but uh, if you, you know, I've actually done this on myself. I've moved my volume from one server to the other, my, where my files live. I didn't log out. The only thing I noticed was just a brief pause for a few seconds while you know, some, uh, you know, some transition, some transactions are happening to enable the, the move. So it's very cool on the sysadmin side. Uh, it's high availability, kind of limited. By that I mean we have, there are read-only snapshots and you can have multiple read-only snapshots of your data. So it's available, the read-only data is highly available. And let me give a little example of that. Uh, we just, actually had a, 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 a planned emergency power outage in a data center. And what happened, and what, the way I prepared for this was I moved all the staff machines, or sorry, the staff volumes out of the affected data center. 
so that we could actually still log in. And when that data center went down, uh, most of our applications were fine because they're replicated. It's read-only data. It's replicated in other buildings. Now, granted, a third of our customer, you know, a third of our users could not log in because their data, their home directory, was in the affected server room, but the rest of the infrastructure mainly stayed up. And aside from that, you could actually, if you'd gone to a Linux machine, you, you would have logged in, but you wouldn't have been able to get to your home directory. So you weren't totally dead in the water, but somewhat. But it's nice to have the high, avail high availability features. And something else that to know, this is POSIX-like. Uh, so it just works like a normal file system. It's not like HDFS or Hadoop where you got some weird craziness going on. No, it's just a normal, it follows normal Unix file system semantics, which is quite nice. <laughs> Definitely. So what we got, uh, we have lots and lots of support for clients and servers, clients especially. Uh, pretty much any major platform we have support for, you know, obviously Linux, Windows, we, you know, we got some crazy stuff in there like HPUX, AIX, Eryx. Uh, you know, some of these are not, uh, not well tested, but they, are, they do actually compile. Uh, we have BuildBot slaves for them. Uh, the server, the heavily used ones are obviously Linux and Solaris. Uh, we've got some people using AI AIX, and we also got some people, you know, not quite as well tested, running macOS servers and uh, HPUCs. The the trick about the server is the server pro uh, the server processes are fairly uh, fairly portable, and by that I mean they're just normal Unix environment. The interesting, the client is more challenging because it normally has kernel hooks to, because it actually uh, installs itself as a network file system. So that's where things get a little, little crazy. So let me walk you through what a typical AFS architecture and looks like. First off, you have to have Kerberos. It can be Active Directory, MIT, or Heimdall. It doesn't really matter. Um, and that will, you know, obviously, that's where your users are stored, your, your service credentials, uh, you know, users bounce off it for passwords. Uh, this last part right here uh, actually answers your question. It uses uh, a DES ink type. Currently, there's a DES style encryption. They're working on upgrading that. Yeah, but what about the data channel? DES level encryption. Single. So, yeah, weakly encrypted. They're working on that. Uh, now, your clients, uh, what they do is they query the metadata from the, the database servers. And I'll, pardon me if I call them cell servers. The old terminology is actually called a cell server. Uh, but you have your metadata sitting on your DB servers. Uh, they fetch the files from the file servers. They cache files and metadata. And they actually take your Kerberos five ticket and they'll convert it into what's called a token, which is what you use for to authenticate and to, to get access to AFS. Now, your DB servers, they have three services. Uh, they hold the metadata for the entire AFS cell. And you have PTS, which does user and groups, VLDB, which is the volume lookup database. This is how, uh, this is how it knows where all the, the files are. All the files are in, in a volume. Everybody's in a volume. A volume lives on a server. So the volume, the, uh, the volume is, exists and is tracked in the metadata service called the Volume Lookup Database. There's also the Backup Database, which just keeps a list of backups that you've run for the AFS backup system. Uh, the file server's pretty boring, serves the files, enforces security, and it reports its volume data back to the VLDB. It also talks, to, coordinates with the other file servers when you're doing moves, so there's a little bit of handshaking going on there. So now, let me, I should, probably should have put these first. Everything lives in a volume. So a volume is a set of files and directories, and a volume is, it, it's kind of like a, a little mini Linux file system. I guess the equivalent may be, a, a server partition is a file system on the server, and a volume lives in it. It 
would be comparable to like a Z pool in NFS or, or in ZFS. There's, you know, your partition is your storage pool. Your volumes live in your partition. There's not a fixed size that the volume is limited to. You simply have a quota that you say, okay, the volume will not get bigger than this, than X, and it won't. Now, well, no, no, the, the partition is like a Z pool, and the volume is more like a Z vol or just a file system that you created on a Z pool, which is kind of like the, the partition. Now, every partition has, well, actually volumes don't have to have a mount point, uh, but in order to access a volume, it needs to be mounted somewhere. So what you have is actually a directed graph of your volume. So you, you look at the root.cell volume, which is the root of your cell, and then that looks like a folder, and under there you have files and folders, and within that volume will be mount points to other volumes, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, like you would do mount, run mount, or DF, in a Linux file system, you'll see all the mount points of the file systems. In AFS land, you would only actually see one mount point for AFS, but it's similar in that there are mount points as you go down the file system when you change into a different directory, you can be traversing a different volume. You'll go through the mount point to a different volume, which may live on an entirely different server. It may not even be in your cell. It may be in a completely different institution. So it's just really cool that way. And the latency may change wildly as you traverse directories, is what you're telling me. I'm sorry, what? Latency may change wildly as you traverse directories. Yes, latency may change wildly as you change directories. Yes, it, it can. You know, you you know, you could be in one directory and it's in your local, you know, a server close to you, and then you change into a different directory, and it's way across the internet, and you don't even notice aside from the latency. Now, you can have uh, partitions and volumes larger than two terabytes, but the quota is the maximum quota you can set on a volume is two terabytes. So it's generally good to just keep it at two terabytes. If you need more, you can. You just, when you start asking for um, the size of the, the partition, you'll get back negative numbers or something weird, really weird. So it's, I have a big multinational conglomerate corporation. Uh, I could keep my company, uh, I could use AFS to uh, create a file system that would expand globally, effectively. Yeah, yeah, so the question was, can, if you're like a multinational corporation, could you use AFS to keep your, your files globally? And the answer is yes. Uh, what you can do in that case, it appears, it, it appears as the same set of files. And what you would do is you could have you know, replicas of the root.cell in every, you know, every continent. Uh, you'd have, ideally, you'd probably have your cell servers or your DB servers on different continents. Uh, latency may be, be, be an issue. Uh, and what's interesting is you can actually have read-only replicas of your top level or, or important documents close to you. I mean, you can have replicas on each continent or in each site so that when you access it, you set the preferences so that you access the closest copy. And if you have a guy who's, and, and obviously, if you're your employees, you know, if you're in Tokyo, your volume should probably be in Tokyo. But if you decide to travel back to the US and you log in, you, you can still access your stuff in Tokyo. It's just going to be really slow. Or if you want to, I mean, if, the guy, if a, an employee transfers from, say, Tokyo to the US, OK, uh, his path didn't change. We just did a VOS, VOS move to move the volume from you know, one file server to another. Now, I think typically when you get into that level, I think people still set up multiple cells. But it's, but yeah, you could definitely do it as a, an entire cell. So it's really cool. And don't let the two terabyte limit fool you. I mean, you, you can split a volume. Anytime you have a folder, that's, you can split that into a different volume. So, and you can have, you know, I, I've, got vol, I've got file servers with 10 terabytes of space or, you know, even more. So you can have just about any, I forget the limit of servers. I want to say you can have like 200 file servers or more. It's, there's quite a few. I mean, you, I mean, 
heavy duty data intensive research institutions run this. And even if you did need to split into different cells, uh, you can still have volume and mount points that actually go to different, you know, go to a completely different cell or a different realm, you know, administer, uh, and like you could be the Tokyo cell and the US cell and that kind of thing. And you actually could have the same, same system accounts, the same user accounts. So you, you could actually just again, act quickly access these in, from anywhere. It's really cool. So as far as services go, you have the, the client, the database server, and the file server. Uh, the database server run, well, all your, all your AFS servers will run something called BOSS, the basic overseer service. And this is a kind of a, it's a nanny or it's, well, it's the BOSS. It keeps, it starts your services, restarts them if they die. You've got your volume location database, PT server for users, and their backup server running on the, the DB servers. On the file server, you have a uh, boss and a file server instance. So you have uh, the demand attached file server, the volume server, which handles volume transactions, uh, and salvage, which is essentially a, you know, a, a disk check. Uh, I forgot to mention that AFS has its own on-disk format, so you don't just have, it's not like you say, I want to share this folder. You actually cannot access the files without using an AFS client or some specialized tools. And the benefit you get from that is that that's how, uh, because it's a special format, it's almost like a database in that it's a special format that is used in transactions between servers. So by giving up that direct file access, you get the nice transactions moving between servers. That's not to say you can't access your files over SMB, but you have to set up some kind of translator from SMB to AFS. I've read about people doing it. Uh, I just don't know how to do it right off. So some of the user commands you'd use uh, to log in, to authenticate, you actually do a knit, so it's your normal Kerberos login, and then you do an AK log to convert your ticket, your Kerberos ticket into an AFS token. Uh, some other commands you use, FS, that's how you would set your ACLs on your directories. Uh, PTS to you know, create users, delete users, create groups, add users to groups, that kind of thing. VOS is the one you, move, you use quite a bit just to move volumes around, create volumes, that kind of thing. Uh, now, if you want to look at documentation, uh, there are some really good documents on the OpenFS website. There's also a wiki. Uh, the, the guide I tend to look at when I set up my cells is the Fedora AFS install. It's kind of, kind of compact and easy to follow. Uh, but the rough procedure is you have to, if you wanted to set up your own cell, you have to set up your Kerberos infrastructure ahead of time. You install the AFS packages. You add a special Kerberos principle. Again, this is the special DES encryption key. And you install that onto that you can convert that into what's called a key file and put that on all of your AFS servers, cell servers and file servers. And then you actually, at that point, you actually install the AFS services like VL server, BU server, PT server, and your file servers. And then you can actually configure your clients. Uh, and you actually need a working client in order to create your root volume and set the access controls on those. And once you set those, you can start adding more clients, more volumes, and you're basically just, pardon me, you're, you're up and running at that point. So now I have a wonderful demo set up for you. So what I've done here is I have a, who here is familiar with Vagrant? Okay, Vagrant. No, okay. You should go, I'll go learn about Vagrant. Vagrant is a, a, a kind of a, your own little cloud, internet cloud in the box. It uses the VirtualBox uh, uh, virtualization engine and helps you set up inter, uh, virtual machines. You can tear the, you easily pick them up and tear them down quite easily. So what I did is I created a vagrant OpenAFS cell that you can actually download for yourself and run it. So that way you can play around with this and you know not have to worry about doing crazy stuff, at least on your production or test boxes. You can just do it on your laptop. So I'm actually creating an AFS server 
NSL from scratch right here. It's right now it's importing everything, it's waiting for the VM to boot. It's all good stuff. I'll give you the GitHub URL later on one of the later slides. So, uh, I don't recall. It's got Amazon and VirtualBox. I don't remember if that is KVM or not. But what the nice thing about this is if you wanted to set it up on real hardware, what I actually did was I made puppet modules for this. So it's pretty easy just to use these and actually set these up on real machines. Uh, I've got a couple of scripts in my, my OpenAFS Vagrant repo that you would use to actually do the initial setup. My, my uh, puppet foo is not quite good enough to, to completely script the setup, especially since it involves setting some passwords a few times. So what it's actually doing here is I'm actually creating a virtual box VM with three hard drives. So what you're saying is you're seeing it initializing the hard drives and formatting and partitioning them. So the way it works is on a file server, all of your partitions are named of the form slash vice P and a letter or two letters. So vice P A, vice P B, vice P C, all the way through vice P A A, vice P A B, and it goes up to, I think you can have like 254 partitions on a file server. So each vice partition is, should be a dedicated file system. And if it's not, then you can actually fake it if you create a file called always attach where the A's are capitalized. So we're actually running Puppet Awesome. Now, my virtual, my Vagrant uh, demo has actually two cells and or two servers in there. Uh, there's the initial cell server and the uh, additional file server. So the first machine is actually running both a cell server and a file server. Oh, you're, what? Hold on. One moment. Come on. It helps if I turn the wireless on. So that was a user error. I forgot to turn on the wireless so I could download the packages that I need to install. Good. Did you turn that off after the last session? Yes, I did. I turned the wireless off uh, during the, uh, the wireless security demonstration. So while that's running, let me uh, give you more of the slides. All right, so in the future, there will be more encryption types. They're already working on that. They're tying in with Kerberos, so they're just gonna get all the Kerberos stuff for free. Uh, they're working on better performance, like 10 gigabit, 10 gig e speed. Uh, I have saturated a gigabit network. Uh, I did that with my file servers just recently. I had like uh, 150 Windows clients doing builds simultaneously, because we're migrating to Windows 7, and we're hitting several file servers. And I actually had, uh, I was actually saturating the gigabit network, the, the gigabit uh, network port on the, on the uh, file server. And I complained to the Windows guys, and what I ended up doing, hey, here's the, the, you know, one of the awesome things, I actually looked at what the biggest volumes were on the servers and moved the volumes to a couple other servers just to spread out the load. Now, I, I didn't do that while the clients were running because I didn't want to make them hiccup or 
you know, pause any, but I did that after we did that batch because we had a thousand machines to, to migrate. Uh, I just moved those after they were done. My grid moved the volumes around a little bit and it, the files, the load was a bit better. Uh, IPv6 is on the roadmap, although it's, I don't know how well it's funded at the moment. And if you go to openafs.org slash roadmap.html, you can get to see all the, the cool stuff that's gonna come in the future. All right, so we've actually run our Puppet config right now, so I'm just gonna log into the, I'm gonna log into my DB server. So as I said, you need a Kerberos infrastructure, so I'm just, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up Kerberos. I have this wonderful script to do that that I wrote. And I forgot to do a trick. All right, don't ever do this on a production, on, a, on thing, something that you care about, the entropy. Ignore the rngd command. Okay, so what I did was I created the stash file, and that's what, how your Kerberos database is encrypted on disk, and then it asked, asked me to create an admin credential. So I have an admin user now. So now that I have Kerberos set up, I can set up the database server. And there's a handy, couple of handy scripts on Debian and Ubuntu called AFS New Cell and AFS Root Ball to help you set up your infrastructure. And I actually use those and a little bit of my extra magic. Our production servers are Red Hat. And don't worry about the, the, this failure. It's just waiting to shut down the daemon, it's all. So you guys actually have your production in AFS exposed to the internet? Not anymore. Okay, so if you look at these, you're seeing that we've created, you know, we're setting up the cell serve DB, which is your config file that says how you, you know, where you drop the IP addresses of your cell servers, so your DB, your DB server so that your clients can talk to one another. Uh, we're creating, actually doing the boss create command to create the, to enable the PT server, the VL server, and then the file server. And now it's running the root vol script to create the root volumes. So every, by default, every AFS client knows that when it looks at a cell, the volume it looks at for slash AFS slash you know, example.org, it looks for the, the cell, sorry, the volume called root.cell. And it, it needs some admin credentials to do all this fun stuff. So I type that in. So it's actually creating the mount points and setting everything up. Now here you're saying it do a VOS release. A VOS release is when you update the read-only replicas. So you have two types. You have couple different types of volumes. You have read-write volumes, you have read-only volumes, and you have backup volumes. 
Backup volumes are really just special cases of read-only volumes. And when you update a read-write volume, you have to run a command called vos release that will then uh, update all the read-only replicas, which is a differential update. It's not a, a full copy. It just copies the differences. Now, I just need to restart my client. So now, so I now have my, my cell online. As I mentioned, if I look at slash AFS, you see multiple cells. I actually trimmed out most of them. Uh, a common cell that you want to look at is grand.central.org, which is one that actually distributes the AFS software. So you can actually, if you had the AFS client installed, you could actually upgrade directly out of the, the RPM, out from the RPMs that are hosted on AFS uh, grandcentral.org. I don't recommend it, but you could actually just download them straight to your local box and then update them. So I'm just going to go ahead and do knit again. I can type. So I've got my Kerberos credentials right here. Now if I run the tokens command, it says I have no tokens, but if I do AK log and I run tokens again, I now have a token, which is your, your uh, kind of your authentication context. And this is something that kind of throws people it expires. So if someone, you got users that just never log out, yeah, they're, they're, they will uh, automatically lose access to their files when their tokens expire. Now you can renew them, you can just do a K in it again, do an AK log and you'll, you're good for another day or another five days or however long you've got Kerberos set to issue you tickets, whatever your ticket lifetime is. So now that I have access to my cell and I've authenticated, I can do whatever I want. I can just update files. Okay, it's complaining because I, I forgot that this is a read-only volume. I can update it if I just go to slash afs slash dot example.org. So that doesn't have the read only on there. This is the, vol the volume name right here, and it tells me what the quota is, how much is used, and how much of the partition is used. And if I just make a file, so here's bar, it has the contents of foo, but you notice it doesn't update, so I have to do a VOS release. And it's telling me it's, it's doing the other uh, release. So what I want to do now, come on. Open a new tab, and I'm going to start up another file server. Now, normally what you do is you can start up and you can run everything on one server, but you have the two different roles, the, the cell server and the file server. And once you actually start expanding, you actually want to take the, typically take the file server role off your cell servers. And cell servers are very paltry. I mean, you could run them off of a Raspberry Pi. I mean, it's very low resource usage. And ideally, you want to have three cell servers. Uh, that actually gives you the minimum redundancy uh, because you need three to establish, you need two thirds to establish a quorum. And at that point, you can actually take one of your cell servers down if you have three and the other two keep functioning normally. If you lose two of the three, then you're now in read-only operations. You can't update your volumes. You can't create users. But you would still, you, you would still be able to access your files. 
And I'll tell you, I actually do my upgrades in my cell servers during the business day. I actually reboot them. People don't, they don't notice besides just a little bit of a, you know, little lag sometimes, sometimes. I should have started this guy earlier. Any, any other questions while I'm waiting for this? No? Believe it. So do not connect it to the internet. 20 bucks. Now it's it's worth noting that you could you have to be able to, in order to authenticate to your AFS cell, you have to be able to connect to both the Kerberos cell and or the Kerberos realm or Kerberos servers and your AFS cell servers and any file servers you need to contact. So if they can't talk to your Kerberos servers, they can't get authenticated access. Now, AFS does have a built-in anonymous access called System Any User, and you can use that just to browse around. That's where the public cells are. That's what they use. Okay, the guy's still formatting the disks. So if you use the LQ FS list quota command, you'll see that here's root.cell. And I also have a service. The service folder happens to be in a volume called service. The user volume happens to be in a volume called the user folder happens to be a volume called user. And the really nice thing about this moving the volumes back and forth is you set up a file server and, oh no, we're running out of disk space, or we need to migrate something, uh, you know, take the server down. You have the option of moving all the data off to a different server. You don't have to notify, it's nice to notify the users, but it's not absolutely required. If you do it at night, you don't even, they won't even notice. Now, if you have a, a really big operation, like a, you're taking a data center down, if you had enough notice and uh, you could actually transfer all of your data out of the file servers in that data center to a different data center. But if you're dealing, it's, it's not very practical when you're dealing with just you know, terabytes of data. I mean, it'll work, it just depends on your network latency and throughput. And if you have enough, enough notice, you can do it. It's just a matter of, you know, the hassle, that's all. And it wasn't, it, is it important enough to you know, do all that work or just suffer the downtime? But you have that choice. So while the server's coming back up, if you want to set up a second AFS file server or third, you actually have to copy a little, a couple of files out of here your configs, which on Debian exist in Etsy OpenFS server. Uh, under other platforms, it may be under slash, a, slash user slash AFS. And what we have is you have cell serve DB, which there's two copies of cell serve DB, one on the client, which tells you how to connect to the cell, and one on the servers to tell them what the other, what their cell servers are. And if you just copy those files to some place, you have to copy them to the other servers in your realm or your cell. Okay. Now that I'm up, I can SSH into it.
So if I copy, the big thing is the cell started DB in the key file. script to help me set up my second file server. And basically all that did was install the local services. So that actually added the DA file server, or DA vault server, salvage server, and DA file server, which is demand attached. So now, what I can do is, as I mentioned before, oh no, we're running out of disk space. So if I do boss examine on the service volume, it'll show me that I'm actually on DB server. But if I just want to move it, should have done that. I can do that in the other cell, the other one. Notice it complained because I didn't have authentication. So here I'm saying move from DB server partition A, which is vice PA, to file server partition A. And you'll, it actually would we'll say it's moving transaction if I did verbose. It takes a little bit, and obviously since I'm you know, emulating two machines on my laptop, it's doing a lot of disk thrashing. Something just to be aware of, one of the gotchas with AFS is your Unix mode bits don't really matter. Oops. Don't matter, matter much anymore. So you see that these files actually, these folders actually have mode 700, say 777. They don't, not effectively. The uh, group and owner bits don't matter. The ACL and the folder is what matters. So the execute bit matters just because you won't be able to execute stuff, but the, when it, for the actual access control, the access control list on that folder is actually what takes precedence. Does normal CLI control work as the way you expect? Uh, what, like if you're doing POSIX ACLs? Uh, I think so. You can no, no, there, there, there'd be different commands. They don't act like ext4 ACLs. Uh, it's use the fs command to set your ACLs. Uh, chmod controls just how I mean, some some programs will will complain if you don't have the the chmod set correctly, the Unix mode bits. So occasionally you do have access, but the mode bits aren't set right. You know how the programs expect. Uh, it's pretty good. You can actually right-click, go to Properties. You see tabs for AFS volume. It tells you what file server you're on, that kind of thing. Can users actually set the read permissions the way they expect to explore? I don't know. There is a tab, there's a tab in the Windows Explorer that lets you set the ACLs. So you can actually add and remove people that way. Okay. So 
So my boss move is actually being a little annoying. Let me go ahead and add a replica site for root.cell. So I can use the add, boss add site command and I give it the, the name. And then the volume. There are long options, by the way. I'm just not, I'm just used to not using them. Okay. Not sure why this isn't working, but. Normally it does work, and of course the presentation gods decided to, to not shine on me. Uh, there are some gotchas, which I want to tell you about. Uh, if you, there's a lot of, some, there are some, uh, some outdated documentation on the internet. If you see anything regarding KA server, ignore it. Uh, also, there used to be an old NTP variant for AFS. Don't use that either, use the normal Linux NTP. Uh, there's also up server. No one uses it. I mean, you can, but it's not really used. You'd use Puppet or Chef instead of that. Uh, locking, whole file locking is good. You get advisory locking. Uh, Windows mandatory locking does not work correctly. Uh, there's no byte range locking. You'll actually acquire an entire file lock. Uh, you don't want to run any kind of database out of AFS. Like if you're running an access database, don't run it as multi-user. Uh, Exchange, or sorry, Outlook personal folders may not work as expected. Uh, and some of the things that people just don't understand is I logged in, I never logged out. Why did I lose access to my files? Their access actually expires. And then when they try to log out, well, things are failing because they can't actually save their session or their, their profile back to the server. So you end up just getting lots of errors at that point. And that doesn't not match with people's expectation that you log in and you just, you know, you, you never lose access once you log in. You, you just stay f connected forever, which is not the case. Uh, batch jobs and cron jobs are interesting. Uh, you have to find a way to authenticate. If you're running services also, there's a wonderful utility called K5 Start by a gentleman, a gentleman by the name of Russ Alberry wrote it. So it, you, what you do is you take a Kerberos password or you get a, what's called a key tab, which is essentially a password in a file for Kerberos and it's encrypted and you will run the service with that context. Uh, other things, there are two different authentication contexts. For example, if I'm root on the box, I cannot, I can become, you know, Joe user, but I cannot gain his AFS credentials unless I actually know the password. So even though it's really cool that way, actually, because if someone gets root on one of my workstations, they don't have any special access in the AFS folders without doing some you know, kind of sniffing passwords or something. Uh, tickets and tokens. So you have Kerberos tickets and AFS tokens, and they are separate, although you just run the aklog command to cop, essentially convert your Kerberos tickets into tokens. So people say, well, it's a ticket, what's a token? It's just some user stuff to keep in mind. Uh, I already mentioned the Unix mode bits act differently. And you can't hard link between different folders because the access controls just don't quite carry over. You know, which, which access control would fit would, would be the one that you look at, the one in the, the parent, you know, the source directory or the destination. So hard links don't work. Soft, link, soft links are fine. Uh, most of the times these don't work, don't, aren't a big issue. And for things like batch jobs and cron jobs, you can either set a, you know, make a dedicated principle for that service. You can add a principle for the box so that it authenticates, or you can just set an IP ACL. So you can actually just grant anonymous access to that particular host. And if you want to find out more, you can all go to, wow, that's terrible, terrible color. Uh, you can go to the AFS website. You can go to, come on. 
basically go to the website or any of these other places. So basically, you can go to go to openafs.org. You can get to the wiki, the docs, uh, IRC, the OpenAFS channel on Freenode. Uh, this demo, you can get it at github.com slash edgester, E-D-G-E-S-T-E-R. So that complaint, that will set up, pardon me, that will set up an entire AFS cell for you with just a couple of scripts so you can play around with it, mess around with it. And if you... Uh, join the mailing list. The mailing list are awesome. They have, the, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask on the mailing list. And if you actually want commercial support, there are a handful of vendors who will actually give you commercial support. So it's all pretty good. Sorry for the technical glitches. I hope everybody learned a lot from here. Any questions, any comments? We haven't noticed. Actually, we haven't noticed the CAD complaining. What happened, okay, let, let, me, let me back up on the byte range locking. What happens when you do byte range locking on AFS is it will actually, to the server, it will get a full file lock. And on the client, it will actually, locally, it will do byte range locking. So the, the programs, it actually works, but, you're, but you can't do byte range locking between two different clients and expect it to work properly. It's just going to be the entire file will be locked, not just that byte range. Yeah, I think in practice that's going to mean if you've got two engineers trying to work on the same gap file at the same time, the second one you try to get in, it's going to say new read only. Correct. Yeah. If you try, if you have two people trying to access the same file at the same time, you will get blocked saying, "Okay, this file is in use." Uh, we don't have that much of a problem. It's not that big a deal in our group. If anybody has any questions, shoot me a Twitter message or just hop on the mailing list. I'm usually on there. Uh, if you want to, you can come talk to me afterwards. But I think I'm done. Thank you. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today 
Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power 
from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.